Hi, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And this afternoon, we shall be talking briefly about Kamala and Donald Trump. Who should the Christian vote for? Who should a baptized member of the church vote for? Because at the end of the day, the Bible encourages us to respect our leaders, right? And to show respect and honor to those who deserve to be honored or to whom honor is due, right? Even though they might not necessarily deserve it, but we should, you know, show honor to whom honor and respect to whom respect is due. But we are also called that to, you know, in um, Romans 12 verse 1, to not be conformed to this world. Right, but we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Right, it means therefore that we cannot at this juncture try to conform to the ways in which the general populace, you know, tend to vote. People tend to vote based on their emotions and based on their family histories and you know what is happening around them, their friends, and whom their friends are voting for because people sometimes they behave as if like dogs who are in a pack, right? So they think alike and they express themselves the same way. They see the world from the same perspective and people tend to congregate as it were, to unite with people who share a similar philosophy. But we ought to be independent thinkers as Christians. We ought to look at things objectively and unemotionally and ask God for wisdom as we seek his truth, and as we seek his divine assistance, his divine help, because it's very important that God renders his guidance and his opinions of our political leaders to us. And he will reveal to us um, in many ways uh, who we should vote for. Now, sometimes, or I should say whom we should vote for, there are some times when we or what should I say now? We tend to vote because we think that something is at stake here. Uh, for example, I might need my student's loan to be forgiven. and But we can't vote based on just one air. We have to look at the entire policies that this particular candidate is presenting to us and you know what morals, the sort of morals that that person is displaying then we can decide whether or not we want to vote for that person, depending on the leading of God himself. Now, Kamala and Donald Trump are two, the two candidates that are running for the United States, that are vying for the presidency of the United States. Now, we have Donald Trump. He was president from 2016 to 2020, right? He came into office in 2016 into office in 2020 upon losing the election to Joseph R. Biden. Um, then we have Kamala, who is the vice, Kamala Harris, I should say, she is the vice president, the current vice president of the United States, and she is a part of the current Biden administration. Now, it's very interesting as we talk about these two candidates to look at their policies. Because so often what I hear from people are emotions and they vote, as I said, based on family history and based on a lot of us are, are also very, very informed, uninformed. We're not particularly informed. And the United States citizens are some of the most propagandized people in the world, if not the most propagandized people in the world in terms of the political machine in that country. Most of the times, U.S. citizens who are on the shore, on the mainland, who live there, do not understand the political machine in the United States. You have to live sometimes in countries like in some countries like Europe, um, in countries like Latin America, um, maybe you know, outside of the United States where they have seen U.S. foreign policies and you can make the connection Right. If you are just there and you're just all you're seeing is what you're seeing, it means, therefore, that more than likely, if you're not reading, if you're not a student of history and you're making the connections, you are not going to be able to decipher what is happening in your politics. And when I talk to people there, um, some of my friends are there also, you can see that they are not aware of the 
the direction, the trajectory that the United States is heading for. And they tend to think that, yes, what they're seeing, what they're hearing is reality. And oftentimes what you're seeing and what you're hearing is not often the reality. And that is where it gets very, very scary. Now, let me get into this, why this is, uh, I, could, I want to get out of this full screen. Um, let me see if I could get out of this full screen. Why this thing coming here now and I need to get out? <laughs> Oh, Lord. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Right. So it, it came back. Right. It came back. But let us look at the the monitor, the Christian monitor, the Christian science monitor. And it talks about Harris versus Donald Trump, Harris versus Trump, where they stand on the big issues. Right. And look at what this is saying. The majority of voters, meanwhile, that's U.S. Vote, voters, are worried about the election. And 52% of Americans say it's difficult to determine what is true and what is not about the candidates and their campaigns when following news coverage, according to a Pew Research Center. So according to a research done by the Pew Research Center, 52% of Americans, 52% of American voters find it very difficult to decipher if what they're hearing is truth about the candidates. They cannot decipher whether it's the truth, what they're hearing about each candidate, about Trump and Harris, is true. 52% of the populace, that's over half of the U.S. population, that's over half of the U.S. electorate. They cannot determine if what they're hearing about the candidates are, is true. Right? They cannot determine that. And that is what we are. This is the predicament. This is the conundrum that we are actually faced with at this given moment. How can you live in a society where you can't determine, you don't know if what you're hearing or what you're seeing is really true? So we're going to look briefly at the some of the policy platforms, right? The policies of both candidates, because that's what we have to vote for. We can't vote based on our emotions, Right. And vote based on what my wife or husband or children are doing. We have to vote based on our conscience and based on educating ourselves about the, the various policy platforms of each candidate. But many people, they're so emotional about it and they tend to follow what their friends are doing. And then they end up, you know, during the pandemic, the same thing happened. People be behaved as if they were in a pack and they followed whatever their doctor told them to do or whatever their friends told them to do without researching for themselves or they tend to what they, the research stopped at what the news said and not what they were not looking beyond what the news said or did not say this is a pro this is also another quandary that we're faced we're being faced with we're faced with at the moment but let's look at the policy platforms, right? And we have, let's speak, you know, begin with reproductive freedom. Now, the whole question of abortion is a very controversial topic in the United States. And uh, people are get very emotional when you talk about, you know, uh, abortion, as we saw when Roe versus Wade was, you know, um, actually rescinded in the United States, that the Democrats, particularly women, went out on the streets and they were very vociferous about reinstating Roe versus Wade, because it's a very important, according to them, they even see it more important than wars that the United States are waging in the world. United States citizens see abortion as being more important, particularly the Democrats, than the United States going to countries around the world and killing women and children, because a lot of the wars that are being waged around the world are slaughtering women and children. Yet at home, the Democrats largely, they think that they should have, the women should have the rights to, to slaughter their children. You know, recently somebody sent me a video of a successful man who is a lawyer and he's running for a particular position. I won't say who this person is, you know, for the person's um, privacy. And, you know, of course, the, these are allegations. They're not necessarily the fact that they, you know, 
necessarily truth what what the video was saying but they are alleging that video alleged that this particular candidate who is running for a particular seat was the victim of incest i mean his father actually raped his sister and that's how he came about what if his sister had aborted him this is a man now who has grown up a successful lawyer who is seeking now to become a, a, a politician right we have to think about these things and i'm not suggesting here that we should tell people what they should do with their bodies because that is between them and god and also between them god um between them and their medical practitioner but the fact of the matter for society to normalize the killing of children irrespective of how they came about is something that you have to really think about you have to ponder on it's not something you should allow your emotions that say oh oh if it's incest or if it is rape because a lot of times when government tell you that when they tell you that it's only because if it's rape or incest then eventually they will extend it to any other matter where if you don't like the child whether or not it's an unwanted child and then we are going to have this thing normalized in our society we cannot at this juncture of our history normalize the brutal slaughter of innocent children, right? That shows an uncivilized country that we are brute animals, as it were. Because even animals, as much as possible, try to protect their young ones as possible, as best as they can, right? They try to protect their young ones as best as they can. Why should rational, intelligent human beings who should be a notch higher, a level higher than these brute animals behave like them. And in some cases, worse than they behave. I don't know. But this is the age in which we are actually living. Now, it's here it says that, you know, former President Trump, he celebrated the end of the half century rule era and took credit for appointing three justices who helped to remove the nationwide right to abortion. But in 2024 campaign, he has tried to indicate he's not an absolutist. So he's shifting his policy decision in some cases here. He is actually um, um, adjusting his belief. He recently said he would veto a, a potential federal abortion ban because it is up to the states to decide based on the will of their voters and that restrictions on abortion should include exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. Of course, the, the life of the mother is important, and these things have to be decided. And I don't have a problem with Trump's plan in terms of leaving the right up to the state, not to the federal government, but up to the state to determine that. Now, if a woman, if a state does not allow abortion to be had, then you can go to another state. I mean, I'm sure there are different state laws, you know, there are laws in different states and in different jurisdictions, and people still, if they, you know, they don't do this in one state, they can go to another state to do it. It doesn't mean, therefore, that all states have to follow the same laws. That's why we have the United States, because each state, while it's, it, 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 it's under the a federal government, right? It functions, it functions under federal government, but they also have autonomy. They have their own constitution, right? And all of that stuff. So we need to also respect each state's decisions and also their value systems. Now, Vice President Harris has been a strong supporter of abortion rights throughout her political career, and she is. And this is perhaps one of her, you know, most impactful, if not cogent, um, policy that she has presented to the American people, right? Kamala tends not to be able to articulate cogently and clearly what she desires, her policy stance. But this, in this one, you must say whenever she gets the opportunity, she defends herself very well in terms of, I don't agree with her policy stance on abortion, but she does communicate this policy stance in a very eloquent and, um, what should I say now, clear, you know, succinct manner. Now, the fact is that she decides that she's focused primarily on having a legislative path to restoring nationwide abortion rights with a bill 
codifying role or guaranteeing a right to abortion up to fetal viability. Now, should we codify role, right? Should we have, should Americans have the right to just abort babies at their own whim? What sort of society are we really trying to craft, to build on, to nurture for posterity? We have to ask ourselves these very critical questions, which I'm sure some of us are not really asking ourselves. Now, we also have um, the economy. In some ways, the candidates' plans are similar. Both pledge to keep taxes low for the vast majority of Americans, and both favor eff um, efforts to produce more goods at home rather than importing them, which is going to be very difficult for them to do because Americans, because of globalization and the fact that, you know, most of these globalists, these corporate, you know, um, what should I say now? Uh, what's the word? Be behemoth, right? These corporate juggernauts. Right? These corporate juggernauts, they want to earn lots of profit. They want to make lots of profits. So in doing that, they go to countries, they export their businesses to countries where they can have very cheap labor or slave labor. In some cases, even slave labor. And they make billions of dollars from doing so. So I don't know if any of these corporate donors, these corporate you know, um, uh, major corporate juggernauts are going to be returning to the United States. I don't think so. I think that they are going to keep their businesses there. So let's see how that will play out. But both of them desire, to some extent, for these corporations to return to America to produce, um, to, be, to have their production done in America. Ms. Harris says that with 2017 Trump's tax cuts set to expire, she won't raise taxes on personal incomes below 400,000. So it seems that the, top, the, the, Trump, the Trump tax cut set um, was not, ex well, it, it's about to expire. And she says that she's not going to um, raise taxes on personal incomes below 400,000, but she calls for a tax hike for corporations and high income Americans, which is not going to happen. We know that they are the ones that they they, they, they um these high income Americans or the, what we call the, the corporations are the ones who donate to these political campaigns and they're not going to when they donate to them they want them to um craft laws and policies amenable to these corporate uh structures. In her plan, the top personal income tax rate would rise from 37% to 39.6%. A new tax would fit, hit unrealized uh, capital gains of the ultra-rich. She also seeks to expand the child tax credit and to create an American forward tax credit to invest in strategic industries. Ms. Harris has promised to respect the Federal Reserve's independence to set monetary policy, which is very bad because they do it at their own whim also, and they are not beholden to the laws of the United States. I am not in agreement with allowing the Federal Reserve to in that independence and giving it that sort of independence to set monetary policy, right? Because it's really destroying sovereignty of the United States as it were. Mr. Trump has said he wants to impose a 60% tariff on all Chinese imports and a 10% to 20% tariffs on imports from anywhere else to boost U.S. manufacturing jobs. I don't think anything is wrong with that if that is what they want to do to so that the jobs can return home to America and Americans can work and they can provide for their families. He aims to, ex to extend his expiring tax, but can he do this? That's the question. Can he get this to pass? I don't think so, because he has to go through Congress. He aims to extend his expiring tax cuts from 2017 and to cut corporate taxes on domestic production. His promise to deport unauthorized immigrants would reduce the overall number of workers and consumers in the economy. Mr. Trump also has said that he thinks the U.S. president should have some way on how the Fed sets interest rates. I think they should, right? Should not only be the, the 
the Fed, the um, the Federal Reserve Agency. Now let us look at climate change, energy and climate change. We know the the Democratic Party is this climate enthusiast, right? And everything should be, you know, renewable energy. <laughs> Even though Kamala and and Biden, right? Kamala and Biden, they are still for fossil fuels, right? They are still for the traditional energy, traditional forms of energy. But they have this sort of ideology that they tether themselves to that, you know, climate change and we're going to all die if we don't fix the climate, right? So they're almost climate obsessed. The Democratic Party is climate obsessed. They're not thinking about poverty, ending poverty, and, you know, and ending this sort of human suffering. They're more talking about climate. And climate is more important than human beings, <laughs> if you listen to them carefully. Now, both candidates paint a picture with abundant energy while differing on which energy sources they support. For instance, both have said they want to be easier for energy companies to get approval for new infrastructure. Ms. Harris puts her focus on developing what many experts see as the next generation of energy, wind, solar, and other renewables. So this, these are what we call renewable form of energies. She recently promised that she would confront the climate crisis with bold action and a major priority would likely to be uh, to continue the major clean energy investments funded by the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act. And Mr. Trump is a big booster of fossil fuels, the coal, the oil, and gas. These are the traditional forms of energy that have long formed the base of U.S. energy economy and which has given the U.S. a lot of wealth. He has and he would withdraw the United States from the world's main climate agreement, support could diminish for regulations focused on climate change and for the federal agencies involved in those regulations, judging by what occurred in the Trump presidency from 2017 to 2021. We remember now that he did withdraw from the Paris Accord, right? the Paris Climate Accord. I am in agreement with that too, because I don't think the climate agenda is something that we are properly informed about. I think they're just telling us about the climate change, but what is the real agenda behind this climate change? We've got to really delve more into that. I don't think I'm going to do that right now because that's not the purpose of the, that's not the purpose of this video, right? We're just highlighting the policy stance of the US presidential candidates. Those who are Kamala and Trump who are vying for the presidency of the United States of America. So shall we continue? Now, we have here, um, we talked about climate change, family issues. We're looking at families and other policy stands. Families perhaps usually or unusually visible as a priority in the presidential campaign, right? So we have issues of safety, education, financial security, gender roles, even immigration, all funnel into a family framework. The campaigns agree on certain goals, but differ in policies. So look at the policy, family, the family agenda, the family policy or policies. Ms. Harris would raise the child tax credit based on a child's age to $6,000 for newborns, $3,600 for children under six, and $3,000 per child age 6 to 17. She suggests that no family should pay more than 7% of their income for child care, which is quite um, reasonable. She pledges to fight attempts to pull public funding from public schools. Hmm. Why would she want to do that? And who would fund the public schools? Are she, is she going to talk about the charter schools, which are largely funded by billionaires? I mean, we have, Americans have to ask themselves the question, when they end public schools and, and federal funding of public schools, who is going to fund it? Who is going to fund public education? Right? That's the question. Now, look at Mr. Trump's policy on family values or family policies, family policies. Mr. Trump calls for extending his 2017 tax cuts, 
which doubled the maximum child tax credit to $2,000. His platform proposes tax credits. Uh, sorry about that. Um, something just came up. I had here experienced a little te technical difficulty here. Um, yeah, so we have that he his platform proposes tax credits for unpaid family members who care for loved ones full time on, on education, which is largely controlled at the local level. Candidate Trump emphasizes parental rights and school choice and eliminating the Department of Education. Now, this has been a very polemical topic also, you know, with his proposal to eliminating the Department of Education, which is very, very political too, right? Something you have to also look at. You have to read about the history of the Department of Education. Now, let us look at their foreign policy, which is something that is interesting. U.S. foreign policy is all about wars, right? Now, for many analysts, the, the biggest difference between the two presidential candidates when it comes to U.S. relations with the world can be boiled down to two world words, multilateral and unilateral. So we know that the Democratic Party has always favored a multilateral approach where they work in conjunction, in collaboration with other allies. You know, I don't think U.S. has, an, uh, has allies. I think U.S. does not believe in a multilateral approach to peace and to solving the problems of the world. I think the U.S. operates like an empire, and as a result of that, she operates unilaterally. So I think it's more empty, vacuous rhetoric of the Democratic Party when they talk about um, a multilateral or multipolar world. I don't think that the, the, the Democratic Party is working towards accomplishing a multilateral world. I think that they are more unilateralists, but they use this rhetoric to fool a lot of the Democrats and those who vote for them to sort of give you this 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 distinction, right? This this sort of false distinction that the Republican Party, they are actually vying for a unilateral world while they are vying for a multipolar world, which is not true if you read the history and if you are versed on your politics, right, and foreign policy, you would see that that is not true. But let's look at their, their multipolar versus their unipolar world. Ms. Harris is seen as a champion of America's in traditional role leading alliances of like-minded democracies like NATO and promoting the post-war liberal world order. And what is that post-war liberal world order? It's an order that is or was made for all countries, including other so-called democracies, to follow the dictates of the United States. It's not for them to make propositions and proposals to the United States. It's for them to follow uncritically the, the dictates of the United States of America, the foreign policy dictates of the United States of America. And we've seen that, you know, over the years, post-World War I, post-World War II, that the U.S. is the country that runs the, of the foreign policies of the world. And many nations, if they do not accede to U.S. foreign policies dictates, that their presidents are often killed, assassinated, or they are... Um, actually taken out of office. They're deposed from the position of the presidency or being prime minister, right? So we understand that Mr. Trump is seen as more comfortable with the idea of the U.S. defending its own interests in an area or in an era, rather, of rising big power competition. So the he is, Trump is actually saying what the United States is. You know, that he, we are the United States of America, we are the reigning empire, and all the other world have to listen. That is what he's, you know, I don't agree with that policy, but that is what the U.S. does. The Democrats are hiding behind this sort of, you know, false image that they are for a multipolar world and that they act multilaterally and that they engage their allies, as it were, to solve the problems of the world. That is not true, right? It does not cohere with the reality. It does not align with what we see happening in history and even happening in our present world, 
right? Whether they you we are under a Democratic president or we're under Republican Party, the US runs the show in most all countries around the world. A few they don't, as like North Korea and some other countries, a few other countries, which they have not yet been able to manipulate. But certainly for the majority of the countries of the world, the U.S. runs the show. Okay? And you have to understand that. So what Trump is proposing, his unilateral approach, is the de facto foreign policy of the United States of America. Now we have housing. America's shortage of affordable housing increasingly affects communities nationwide, right? Home prices hit an all-time high this year, and about one in four renters spend more than half their income on housing and utilities. I'll repeat that. One in four renters spend more than one half their income on housing and utilities. So we have here that Ms. Harris sets a goal of three million new housing units in her first four years. She proposes a 40 billion innovation fund for housing expansion, which would encourage more flexible local zoning and expanded development. She also calls for a $25,000 down payment credit for first time home buyers and pledges to curb price fixing among corporate landlords. Mr. Trump, on the other hand, promises general low inflation and deregulation, which would allow mortgage rates to fall and homes to be built more cheaply. He points to his restrictive immigration policies as a solution to easing house demand. Right. So this is these are the two um, policy stands of these two candidates. Now we have on immigration and border, Mr. Harris, Ms. Harris, rather, a longtime immigrant advocate, has taken a right turn on this issue amid public pressure over a historic influx of unauthorized migrants under President Joe Biden. The Biden-Harris White House has stouted a reduction in illegal border crossings in recent months following new asylum restrictions, along with enforcement help from Mexico. She says fixing the broken immigration system falls on Congress and blames Mr. Trump for tanking a bipartisan bill on border security. What I can say is that they always have had a bipartisan agreement <laughs> on border security, no matter how they're acting, right? Because this has been a long standing problem of the United States and they don't want to solve it, right? Because it gives them fodder to blame each other at every successive election, right? So that's what it's just electioneering and trying to fool and to propagandize the American people. Mr. Trump, on the other hand, has said he'd involve the military in the largest deportation operation in American history, calling illegal immigration and invasion, right? <laughs> he also supports limiting legal immigration, including set resettling refugees. What they're not saying is that the U.S. and the U.S. foreign policy is responsible largely for the influx of illegal immigrants into the United States. Neither the Democrats nor the Republicans are suggesting that, that the U.S. foreign policy is the major cause, stands at the root cause of this high influx of illegal immigrants that are heading to the United States of America. And if we look at what is happening in Haiti, that's a very prime example of U.S.'s domination, hegemony in the region and how it's affecting people and their security, their permanent security in their own countries. In addition, Mr. Trump also says he'll resurrect the remain in Mexico policy from his time in office, which made asylum seekers who arrived at the southern border wait in Mexico rather than the United States ahead of immigration court dates. That's interesting. So even if they're not citizens of Mexico, they would have to remain in Mexico until they have, um, you know, um, their, they have their set court dates to battle that sort of illegal immigration. Now, national security and the military. 
Ms. Harris is expected to continue the White House's military support for Ukraine's efforts to repel Russia's invasion and illegal occupation on Gaza while she condemns Hamas' October 7th attack and emphasizes that Israel has a right to defend itself. She also says she will not be silent about the suffering of Palestinians. Mr. Trump has promised to end fighting in Ukraine in one day through negotiations. Without offering specifics, he's implied he could do this in part by lifting U.S. sanctions against Russia. On the Middle East, he has said that Israel needs to get its war in Gaza done quickly and that Israel would hit Iran's nuclear facilities. So he's for war as Kamala Harris. And it means, therefore, that the Middle East is going to be, America's going to be in the Middle East for a long time. Because if you read the document, the project for the new American century, America has long wanted to invade Iran and to control many of those Middle Eastern countries. And they're just using Israel as a proxy to get that agenda on board, right? To get that agenda realized. So we cannot think that Trump is going to be different. He is just as pro-Israel and pro-Israel's being used as a proxy to wage war in that uh, section of the hemisphere. So let's not be fooled here and think Trump is anti-war and Kamala is um, pro-war. As far as we're concerned and as far as we can see, both are pro-Israel and for Israel lobbyists. So it means, therefore, that we won't see any great difference, any, we have not seen any great or any distinctive policy stance where that is concerned. So we have to look carefully at these policies and look careful to see where we are heading as a people and where the world is heading because this election is also, while it's going to be had in the United States, but it's going to have ripple effects on other parts of the world, such as the Caribbean, Latin America, Africa, Asia, or just around the world. And many people are not seeing that, that the United States is moving into another century, as it were. I mean, this is the century of wars. And I think that there are going to be unending wars, which will eventually end up in a totalitarian form of government on U.S. soil. It is going to end up in a totalitarian form of government on U.S. soil. Because the more you restrict rights in other countries, the more rights will be restricted at home. And yesterday I was having a conversation with one of my friends about the fact that, you know, censorship in America. And many people are not seeing that there are censorship attempts and policies on U.S. books now to censor Americans, what they're allowed to say, what they can say, even on these platforms, these social media platforms. If you have a YouTube account, you are not going to be allowed to say things. By the way, make sure you're liking and subscribing so that the videos can be shared with as many people on the platform, right? But the more you like the videos, it's the more the platform, the algorithms will be you know, we'll send your visit, we'll send these videos to as many people as possible. But we're moving into another era. I think we're already in that era of censorship. And many things that we have on our minds and many truths that we would like to share, we're not going to be able to share because we're not as free as we think we are. So this consequential election of 2024, yes, is consequential and is leading the United States further into a time when it's going to speak like a dragon. It's already a dragon, <laughs> but it's not yet, it's not yet speaking like the dragon, right? Because it's a beast, right? We talked about that in Revelation 13, that the United States is this lamb-like beast. So it's a beast. And eventually we can see where it is. We can hear the sound, the dragon-like sounds in our head as the U.S. trumpets wars around the world. And as wars are being trumpeted, trumpeted so are our liberties, our civil liberties 
being restricted. So I hope that you will ask God for wisdom, for courage, for understanding, for knowledge. Some of us think that we are so bright and we have all the knowledge that we're supposed to have. And we don't want to humble ourselves to read a little bit more and to study the history of the United States, to study the prophetic, the prophetic understanding of U.S. and the role that the U.S. will play as this world comes to an end. This world as we know it is coming to an end an end. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you would like and share and subscribe and look forward to seeing you in another video. All the best to you. And remember now that you need to keep the faith.